the battle between NA's mean green fighting machines <laughs> rages on. They, both their logos are green. <laughs> it's trying to keep things interesting, guys. It's currently 2-0. LFM, as of yet, struggling to get their first win versus Endemic. Yes. Yesterday, Jolly Green Giant. Today, <laughs> Mean Green Machine. Tomorrow, what? It's not easy being green, Jay Howe. That's what I've learned today. Okay, hit me with more. Uh, there's Zagara's there's a, a green back. Uh, someone, someone is green with envy at how well Endemic's been playing. I know I am, because they've been playing pretty well. You want more? You <laughs> Do I? <laughs> Is it Towers of Doom? Do we get some green going on here? No. Opposite. LFM switch things up. Oh, I said that. If LFM switch over to Battleground Choice, I think we'll be going to Sky Temple. And so we are. Jay, how what do you make of Sky Temple for these two teams? First ban, Apathur. All right. No questions asked, which leaves open a Genji Tracer. And I think that if you're LFM, you want that Genji. I think you need that Genji to speed up the pace, to give a little bit more threat, because I think they've been lacking in that department so far. So for them, they are going to be second pick in this situation. If you're afraid of giving up Genji, then maybe you try and play around ban the Genji, see if they ban the after. I don't know, they gotta do something to mix this up because the pacing just, it doesn't seem like what we would expect from this LFM team who knowingly probably wants to be aggressive at times. They're just having trouble initiating. I'm gonna hit you with something and I don't want swabs to hit people. It's a saying, okay? Oh, oh, we well, you didn't follow it up saying. quick enough and you gave <laughs> me like this look. There was no look. That look was, Think about this. It was literally just, I'm going to hit you with something. Pause. <laughs> Longer pause. Look, pausing is what I do when I talk sometimes, OK? It's called thinking before speaking. Uh, I'm going to hit you with something. And that thing is not something physical. And that's, I want Suaves to play to Haka instead of Ural. Like, I know I know that she is awesome, and he's he, he's made plays with her, but I feel like the plays that he makes with drag have just been so much more impactful for this team. I 100% agree with you. All right. I 100% agree with you. So obviously, Genji not going to be available, and Endemic is making sure that Phoenix has had such a high priority for this team. Mm -hmm. Two different Phoenix players, and Dainsky has been doing a lot with this hero. They've had a lot of very awesome early game rotations, control of camps, and this Phoenix enables that quite a lot, especially with his wave player. All right. Dahaka Jaina? Dahaka. I don't, they could Lee Ming later on. I'm, I'm totally cool if you want to Lee Ming later. I think the yeah, Jaina for them, unless they have super initiation like an yeah. ATC, and even then that's scary because like, how do you engage into that? I'm totally okay if they just want to bring the Lee Ming later. I am a thousand percent okay with that. Maybe Dahaka and uh, Hanzo, potentially. I can dig it. Or I Malfurion. Mean, Hanzo gives you boss control if you want to play around that. Muradin. So that gives them initiation with Muradin. It also gives you the global that we both think that they desperately need. Uh, so it's it's one of those things that... Um, oh, 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 hey. <laughs> Why didn't you commit? You started it and then jabated me into that. So I started it and the camera moved. <laughs> you can still move. Well, although you are on a platform <laughs> yeah. that has only so much distance There's to travel. Only so far I can move around this desk, guys. It's... Quit! We're analyzing a draft. Yeah, but I'm analyzing how big that box is. <laughs> Figured it's probably like a three by one, so three across, nine feet with two in the mid, so we got it. This is quality content right here. Dahaka Muradin is great too. Muradin feels like it fits the theme of things that have been working for LFM. I, I felt like things were better for them. Not anything against Fury, it's more so what has been working for the team. And later on, they still have an option for something like a Leeming with the follow-up damage there. Malfurion and Johanna, though, will be the next two picks for Endemic. And see, this is where I think that Dahaka uh, De definitely has a much stronger place, is that you can brush Stalker in, get onto that Malfurion. We even see, you know, potential around the boss, come in on the backside, make the plays. Mm -hmm. We've seen that already once before. It's an opportunity to happen again, and I think with Muradin, holding point is definitely something they can do, but 
Again, the damage is there. And I think Li Ming is definitely considered here. And it's almost possible, I think Endemic might actually try and get a ban on that. There's a lot of things you can ban at this point. Li Ming is, this is one of those rare times where I'd be okay with a Li Ming ban. Just knowing the fact that Figgy has played that a lot, I'd much, I'd be more willing to play into a Jaina than I would a Li Ming. They both offer different forms of boss control. But again, the Hanzo, I think, also has to be in consideration here if you are looking to ban some of that damage. Blaze ban from LFM. Wanting to have the better of the solo. And of course, if they do want a double reset composition, I mean, Genji's off the table, but there's still things like maybe a Leeming and a Grey Main. Um, Bunker staunches a lot of that. So they're gonna stop that out now. Hanzo ban over the Leeming. And it takes away a lot of boss control. Yeah, it does. There is felt like Endemic throughout their drafts have been pretty focused on droplets. I, I do think that part of their high Phoenix control has been prioritizing some of droplets heroes, hero pool, especially since we've seen, you know, Genji be banned by LFM or Endemic, Phoenix be picked up that early. Phoenix is obviously a good hero though. There is a composition that has not been shown yet by LFM that I know they are willing to run. If it happens, we'll talk about it. Okay. But there is some flexibility on this team that we don't talk about too often yet. I'm curious if this might be the time that they run it. You don't want to leak anything, but when it shows, you'll know it. And if it's going to happen, I think this might be the moment. Is this where the magic happens? It's, it's still it's still a possibility. Okay. It's still a possibility. Jaina over Lee Ming here. Yeah, the amount of lockdown I think that you get, the potential AOE lockdown that you would get out of an ETC, not exactly there with a Muradin. Obviously, Dahaka can go there, but we have seen that Jaina did have the impact on that boss. Is if there is the, hey, you're going to stand on point, I'm going to stand on point, you just drop that blizzard right down there, dare them to stand there and see how much damage they can actually take. So that does give you a different form of control as opposed to maybe a wave of force and some leaming combos. We now have two picks left for Endemic. One of the backliners. They... No. Never mind. Hmm. We're two, we're two on Sonya, by the way. Yeah, they could Lee Ming. And yeah, they could Sonya too. But we've also seen at times some teams have been willing to run Phoenix as the solo laner. I don't know if this is the time where you want to go triple backline, but... I was... Hmm. But I was going to say Task Tracer, and then I decided against it because that would have been the triple backline that I was considering too. They'll still Tracer though, but this time they have a URL with this. Yeah, and Tracer has a lot of options with very little lockdown on the other side. Muradin has to land a Stormbolt, Dahaka has to land a Tongue. Beyond that, those are tough options. Yes, a lot of times LFM have been leaving their tank till the very end and then picking something like Varian we saw once versus that Tracer to get the guaranteed lockdown. In lieu of that, any point in quick CC that you can think of on the outset of this? I mean, I'm totally cool if we get a gray main again. I mean, I don't think yeah. this is where we are gonna see it from LFM, but if I were talking about any other team, I would be okay with the gray main here. It gives you, again, that trade potential against the Tracer. It's not exactly the best to go into against a Johanna and potentially a Yorel, but they need something that can at least thwart the onslaught of a potential Tracer dying in your back line. All right. That's... One we don't see often, but has been known to be a Tracer counter. Yes, Cassia has blinds. There is the new uh, talent that changed Seraph's Hem at level one, which has, among a lot of other things, cooldown reduction for your blind two. Cassia, though, has been changed with all the armor changes. Uh, she got health and health regen along with the other heroes who received the armor changes, but as a result, her avoidance is less. It went from, I believe, 65 to 40. 40. Yeah, it's at 40. So um, it's... Tracer also had her basic attack damage reduced a little bit, so we're going to get to see how this iteration of Cassia matches up versus a Tracer. 
I mean, on paper, one of the best things to do against the Cassie is to bring spell damage, and Pulse Bomb is that. So now that you have the higher health pool, it does make it a little bit easier to go into that. Again, the damage trade-off in terms of the auto attacks versus the physical armor you're getting there, a little different. But again, the blind, I think in particular that you said, getting more damage, the cooldown reduction, plus that bonus damage, that chunks pretty hard because it's 100% more bonus damage yes. on top of that 20% that you have passively. So I think that does give you quite a bit, but we aren't going to see that. We're going to see charge strikes, keeping it classy. Charge strikes can get a lot. You have Urel and Johanna up in the front, and if there's some grouping around temples and the like, trying to get more out of that. But what I do want to mention is that a lot of these Cassia drafts that you set up, you ideally have another blind with Cassia to get more out of things like Ring of the Leech. There is nothing else here for this team. It is purely the Cassia in straight response to Tracer, though blinds will also be able to help versus a little bit with Burel, but also with uh, the Phoenix. But Johanna has blinds too, so this is not going to be the easiest of Cassia games to try to counter that Tracer. I like how everybody casually walked in, and then Yorel just whips out this giant hammer and just smacks everybody away. So one of the best ways to deal with that type of push is to just counter push, and that's exactly what Endemic did, getting a little bit of structure damage in, which, depending on the temple prioritization, could come in. We've seen some really strong rotations from Endemic based around the camps in the early game. And we've seen a lot of teams, depending on how they want to prioritize that top night camp, whether they want to be first or they want to be second. Generally, the teams that do it second are the teams that could get more value because they time that right around the temple. They get pushed during that. It gives them lane control. It gives them temple control. And a lot of times moves in to get in a very early fort. All of them are making the faster a transition to that lane after getting the Giants, whereas Malfurion and Tracer are going to stick toward the bottom for the moment and see if they can get some more sieging done. It does feel like this endemic this week is really focused on early structure damage, early sieging wherever they can, and they're going to see Dahaka stock down to the bottom, setting up for this first temple phase. Well, they've cleared the night camp, and it's a matter of timing. I think they're waiting to see what Endemic does. Both teams have reasonably decent wave clear when it comes to those Knights. Jaina, obviously the spell aura there, but Jaina does tend to burst through a lot of that with the Blizzard. Phoenix has really good clear, so it's not a matter of can you clear. It's just more of a matter of timing for both of these teams on how they want to prioritize the rotation. Temple phase happening in 40. Neither team, it's just a standoff for who wants to cap those bruisers earlier. How about uh, Cassia switching things up here at level four? As you said, there's less value with mm -hmm. that blind because you don't have as many blind opportunities. Instead, going into inner light, which it gives you a bigger radius. So if you're trying to hit a highly mobile tracer with the blind, you get that. But you also, if you get stunned or rooted, you also get the blind to fall down underneath you. Not normally as value in the circumstance. I think it's more just the radius than anything, but does have its value in multiple ways. Well, there, are, you've talked quite a bit about the mini stun that's in Condemn, Condemn Blessed Shield. There's a six second cooldown in between when it can proc, but between that, the stun of Ural, the root of Malfurion, there are a lot of different things to set that off. And if you have a Ural and a Johanna barreling down on you, possibly the Tracer too, if she's starting to come in and put some damage in, it may be enough to help you survive. And because, again, we don't see another blind to get more out of the Ring of the Leech, there is the adaptation there, which is nice to see. And I want to talk about adaptation and improvisation at this point, because generally, if you time this to get the second one, everybody's like, well, we get this, and then we get a guaranteed top port. Endemic, they counter pushed mid and got basically the entire bottom tower of that mid lane. And now we see their rotation out. This is adaptation. Every time we see some new iteration of the meta in terms of the macro, we now see a different approach. Not only did they take down the entire fort wall with that temple, they took down the fort and they instantly rotated bottom. This is a team with a clear strategy, a clear early game strategy. And you could argue, Gilly, this is paying more dividends than the rotation that we're seeing now from LFM. Well, it's better Siege, Jay Howe. 
with the heroes that they have. And mainly, that's Phoenix, who may die here. He's going to Stormbolt hit out of the warp, but Nature's Cure was there to get him out. Uh, it's just w that Phoenix does so much with his uh, consistent damage, whereas Jaina, you're looking at a very combo-centered hero, a cooldown-focused hero. And then Cassia, she can't blind structures, so she's just old-fashioned siege uh, her way. So being able to use that every single game, and we have seen those game plans pay off for Endemic for here. It's a slight experience advantage, but LFM are starting to figure that out. They counter push the top, they get that with the temple, but losing out the towers in the bottom could be problematic if Endemic keeps this experience lead all the way into the next temple phase. Again, they've had excellent early game strategies and they're kind of changing the way that we look at this map every week. It seems like somebody has a new strategy every day, the way that people play around those nights and then Endemic comes in, changes it again. Dainsky eats a bit of damage, only loses his shield. The countering Engagement here by B-Kid and the Pulse Bomb onto Cassia. Now all of a sudden, Muradin looking to run and it looks like the rest of Endemic, they're like, look, that's nice and all, but we got Siege Giants still here on the bottom and they are pushing that lead that was just a quarter, half level lead a moment ago, Gilly. Full level now. The level they can use on this fort. Two seconds until Cassia is back. There's no 10 here. An LFM stay, Blessed Shield, Purification Salvo takes down Rhaegar. Biggie chases down Jaina, and Muradin's gonna fall behind all of that, sticking around when they didn't have heroics, when Endemic could lock them down, when they could dive underneath the fort with the minions, and Endemic are out for a whole lot more and a whole faster game. That brings up an entirely new problem. And with that bot fort down, the top fort did take a little bit of damage from that earlier wave, but nowhere near enough. So the temple should conceivably take that down. When that happens, and this is an early temple, we don't see this general rotation, so we'll have to see how much damage that does. That just empowers the boss bot lane because it, the temples prioritize the closest lane. And you can see this rotation up from Endemic. They want to do damage to that top fort to make this boss even more powerful. You start to take down this structure, there, it looks like they're going to go ahead and back off on that, maybe look. And you could see there was a decision to potentially go up. Instead, I think they're going to try and push Droplets. Well, Droplets is about to die, I believe. Yeah, this team is heavily separated. Droplets, the first, but likely not the last. Great hammer from Cure as he knocks Figgy into a corner. Two kills, two more kills, six to zero for Endemic, who have amassed such a lead in this third and possibly final game here. LFM has some tough decisions to make if they're gonna make it back in this game. That channel is now back again. When that temple falls, or when that top fort falls, then the, the shots will focus here on the bottom. And this, you, you, you got to address it, right? So you can look at this differently. You can always say the win condition opens up early game from that early boss. But now we have to look at it in the sense that it's normally five minutes to 10 minutes down the road on that second cycle. Now at seven and a half minutes in, that bottom lane has been opened up so much that a later game, a mid game boss at this point guarantees keep and potentially gain. And that is the difference of this early game strategy that we see. There is no wall that is going directly to keep and depending on where the next temples are, if it's top bottom, you best believe Endemic will be prioritizing that bottom one to take down the first keep of the game. Yeah, getting an early keep does so much for the confidence of a team, but just for the game and what your opponents have to do for the rest of the game trying to defend versus those catapults. Endemic backs off for a little bit, though they have the um, talent to your advantage. This is something that you can see teams do on at Sky Temple. When you have that much of a structural lead, and when you have the objective that fires on structures directly, there is no need to present yourself for any fight, regardless of if you have the experience advantage, and this is just the level 13. They add camps available, they'll pick those up, they'll push back LFM, and they'll get in a good spot. And Jay Howe, look where the temples are. Top bottom, and as much as I stress that Endemic should look to get that bottom lane, to get down that bottom keep, it would 100% guarantee it. They're doing work in every lane. And it's times where you don't always want to let your foot off the gas. But this is a map where you have this much of a sizable lead. The world is your oyster. You can take one temple and trade here, and you still have such a colossal advantage structurally that there's nothing that LFM can do. So playing around those rotations for Endemic, they can literally do whatever they want. And LFM, you can see on the minimap, their rotations around Gilly. They are looking for any chance to get a kill, and it's 
they're chasing ghosts right now. Much like the priority for LFM or for Endemic would be to take down that keep, LFM now want to focus on that bottom lane so they don't lose that keep there, especially since with how far behind they've fallen, they're not getting many opportunities to get a fair fight. And this is going to be one of the few getting this 13 and immediately taking the fight. And Dimmick knows this. They keep Urel up in the top. Phoenix is soaking that out, and they are playing exceptionally in how safe they are, not giving any opportunity at all for LFM to punish. Well, LFM is making the correct call here by scouting the area, seeing what they can make happen, taking over vision, and then bring Dahaka in if needed. But they bring Dahaka in right away. Dainsky with the sidestep. Is it going to be enough? Fury comes in. That's actually going to be a kill. That is a major start for them. We do see Endemic, do, they do rotate to the bottom. The global's no longer there. It's almost wondering, could you have gotten that kill without the rotation mm. from Dahaka? Because now you've got to rotate all the way back down to the bottom of the map. Johanna's positioning, which you can look at on the minimap, is key to making sure that if there is a rotation down, Urel scouting this out as well. They want to keep them at bay by as much time, which is why you see Tracer on the point, because she has the most mobility in this composition. So if there is a rotation down, Tracer scoots on out. I think it's hard because LFM wanted to keep everyone together so that they didn't suffer from uh, somebody dying to Endemic rotating in. And they did get Dansky and the control was there. And he did try to throw out the uh, the isolation and he's part of the stun lock too. But now, Tahaka's not here. Great early Ancestral, but Droplets, he, he is not out of this. He's gone, and there might be more to follow. Kira with the big hammers coming in. Biggie, he's not much longer for this world. All the damage is gone. Swaps, he's in the fight. Essence is used. He's going to bur burrow under for the moment. Boss. Wow. And this might be the victory march. This is that five-minute cycle with that wind condition open, and it's played out almost perfectly here for Endemic. They got the bottom lane structures. They ended up getting that bottom temple, which now has opened up a clear path for this boss. And that five-minute window is up for LFM, and Intimic's gonna be looking to end here in just a moment. I just feel like there is not much better of a game to be played yeah. than what we're seeing from Endemic, because it's not only the game plan and the setup, the early push with Phoenix, it's those improvisational moments, pushing mid, losing Dane Ski top, okay, we take the temple bottom, that's what we wanted all along. We forced you to come up to respond to us, and then we get the keep instead. Like, this is, this is the endemic when we heard that this might be a top five team from Fan, this is the endemic he meant. Yeah, Fury, he's on the back line, putting damage onto Dansky. Isolation was used as well, but they're just dancing around. Warping in, did get that armor at level 13. Another stun. Tranquility's out. The boss is on the core. Salvo's going to be in response. Pulse Bomb's going to take down one. Phoenix is going to be traded out on Figgy down. And with the shields down and two members on the side of LFM, it's all she wrote in Demic here, coming out with a clean 3-0 over LFM. And it felt like it got cleaner and cleaner throughout the series. That game looked good for Endemic. More accidental hearths coming out there from Big EB Kid and Michael Udall, but that was... Look, I know you want more excitement sometimes in Heroes, and there was a, a decent amount of kills there for Endemic, but if you are a true fan of Heroes and the way this game is played, that was beautiful to watch. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, watching that unfold and the way that they were able to manipulate and, again, change up the pace on what we generally expect, I, I would not have asked for a much cleaner game than that. Yeah, that was a dance, almost, what we just saw from Endemic. And Hard times for LFM. It felt like they tried to change some things up from their series versus Heroes Hearth, and we didn't know what kind of endemic we would see. We didn't know if the match versus Simplicity would rattle them, because after we saw a very similar showing versus No Tomorrow, though not, I would say not even as clean as what we just saw here. Like there was that one over aggressive boss moment uh, that No Tomorrow punished, forced uh, endemic to have to fight back. We didn't know what Endemic we were going to get here, and it's great to see that they took that loss not too hard from its simplicity. I think in scrim results and the respect that they get from teams is probably due to games like that, because when you have that potential and you can do that and you can kind of change the pacing a little bit, I mean, it just seemed every single game 
that first Punisher on Infernal Shrines told me a lot about what they were trying to do coming into today. Because getting that much value, zero kills, mind you, in that early part of that game, but somehow had a level and a half, almost two level lead at one point in the middle of that with zero kills. That is so hard to do. And they were able to do that. Game number two, another clear strategy, obviously backfired a little bit on that first top push on Dragonshire, but even coming into this game, there was a clear and concise strategy for every single game that they played today. Yeah, and it was stellar to behold. Let's check in and find out more about that strategy from Big E, as we have him here representing Endemic. Big E, congratulations, friend, for your 3-0 win. You guys came in, and it seemed like you had everything figured out strategically. Uh, walk me through how you prepared for this match. Uh, how we prepared was kind of, I think we we actually got four blocks canceled on this week. So we oh. didn't come in this with a lot of scrims. So I think uh, since we won with that, our teams are like, maybe we shouldn't scrim as much. But I, I don't think we're going to do that. Yeah, probably. Practice is good. That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to know about the Phoenix because you guys had a lot of emphasis on him. He seemed to work out really well in your ability to uh, take out structures really early on. Um, is this something that was focused on for this match, or do you just feel like that is how strong of a hero he is right now? Uh, a lot of our strategies in Curious Head, so I, maybe I'm not the best, best person to ask, but okay. I think we're just really comfortable as a team with Phoenix, and yeah. uh, Dainsky said he's OP, and I think he's OP, so we just picked it. All right. Well, I'll send you over to Jay Howe for more questions. Talk to you soon. Congrats again. Right, thank you. I want to address, uh, I guess, the early game strategies because it seemed like every map you guys have an early game strategy prepared, but it's different, right? You've, we've seen the night mm -hmm. rotation. We've seen the early game pushes, but you guys had a clear strategy for everyone. How much of this is improvisation and how much of this is planned in advance to kind of shake up what we know to be the macro meta that we've seen through the first few weeks? I mean, uh, it depends on like comps, obviously. Like, not every comp is played the same. So, depending on what we draft, we have specific strategies. Like, if we're a strong push comp, you know, we'll push with knights. If not, then we go the other route. We guys, you mentioned you had some scrim blocks canceled this week, and you guys had a tale of two series last weekend. This is the endemic that a lot of people are kind of touting amongst the top teams. I'm sure you've seen the interviews. A lot of people are saying you guys are a top five team. Is this the team that we can expect week in and week out, or how much work do you guys have to do to get this level of play consistently? Uh, we need a lot of work. Like, I mean, we have three row swaps, obviously, and uh, everyone's just kind of still finding the rhythm, and we just need to not get complacent. But if we do... I think I think we'll get we'll be there. So well, just give us some time. Give us some time. Western Clash still very much in you guys' sights, I imagine, getting that top four before then. Of course. Uh, you got that Tracer pick towards the end there. We were kind of wondering if anybody would get their hands on Tracer or Genji, obviously Genji being a high priority ban, but when all of a sudden you see that line of Cassia and Jaina and not a lot of lockdown, what's it like picking Tracer on a map like Sky Temple knowing that you can pretty much get on that back line pretty easily? So free. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, it's that's. A, I guess that's enough words to <laughs> summarize that. <laughs> uh, but it definitely looked good, and we know that your tracer play is top notch, and uh, you definitely looked amazing that last game and throughout the series. Congrats on the victory today. Thank you. Biggie, you guys' next match uh, will be next weekend, and it's versus Team Freedom, and I feel like. If you guys play how you played today, that is going to be such an amazing match. What do you feel like you guys need to do to get a win versus Team Freedom in that one? Mm, we just need to prepare well, you know, come up with some strong drafts and some wild stuff if we can and play well. Don't get complacent. That's, that's the only way. All right. Well, good luck to you. Good luck in your preparations for that match this week. I'll be looking forward to it. And any shout outs before you go? Uh, shout outs to Paul George, our owner. Uh, our owner, Mike, and Endemic, and shout out to my teammates and Courtney for being our analyst and my family. Thank you, Biggie. Congrats again. So, so free. I mean, that pretty much summarized <laughs> so, it pretty so easily. That, that it was, I mean, that was a really good performance mm -hmm. by him. I mean, it was a matter of control, 
It's like, do I need to go in? No. Can I go in? Yes. Okay, it's free. And I think that that to me shows the draft advantage they know. He said the, the strategies are in Kira's mind. We know Michael Udall has shot calling roles. Dansky, the like that, again, the experience from Dansky and Kira in particular coming in to solidify that, something Udall touched on previously is having those minds coming in. And those strategies that we saw today, Sure, people are going to learn from them. They're going to watch and learn. I'm sure they're learning in scrims, but those have to be made note of. Yeah, that's why I feel like if they play like that, they could give freedom a run for their money. And Endemic and losing the simplicity, if they want to be top four to go to Western Clash, they have to be one of those. Team Freedom, Octalysis, uh, Heroes Hearth, you know, uh, Tempo Storm 2. Somebody's got to give if Endemic are going to get their way in there. Um, for me, it's, I think, when you look at some of those larger battlegrounds with Abathur 2, when Genji has to be banned, and you can pick up Malfurion, knowing that you have that Tracer opportunity to you in your back pocket needs to be make, made note of, especially for a first pick team like that. They didn't even get Malfurion first pick, so I, I have been enjoying how we see the bans continue to evolve, and we'll see it evolve into tomorrow, too, as we take a look at the schedule for what you can expect from your HGC Sunday. What's happening in Europe, Jay Hal? Well, Dignitas versus Monkey Menagerie, who looked very good in their last series, but Dignitas knows sits on the throne there in Europe. We'll see if Monkey Menagerie can take that down. But a very important matchup is Method Ooh. and Fnatic, and there is a lot of history between these two teams. Both of them sit in at one and one. They want to move up there in Europe before we make our way to NA. In NA, if Simplicity want to prove themselves that they hang with the best, this is a pretty good place to do so versus Tempo Storm. Really looking forward to that one and seeing if Simplicity can keep the hype going after last weekend and their win over Endemic themselves. And then the capstone of the day, IMO. I don't know, Method Fanatic's pretty good, but Octalysis versus Heroes Heart Esports. Octalysis ran Tempo Storm all the way to game five. Tempo Storm made that reverse sweep that Tempo Storm seems to be known for these days happen. But those first two games for Octalysis looked awesome. We'll see if they can keep that up versus Heroes Heart. They need a lot more of that. Heroes Hearth, we know, ran the table in part two. They were at that spot at midseason brawl that Octalysis wanted. Their last series obviously was in the playoffs in that best of five, went all the way to, to, to five games. So we know they are highly competitive in their matchups. So that whole day, and again, I know somewhere in Simplicity's mind, they're listening to fans' interview saying, hey, we know there's some top five teams out there, and he left Simplicity off that list. I guarantee you those Simplicity guys were listening. I do too. He did say they were a dark horse, but I think but not want top to say five. Exactly. That's the most important. But what I'm about using that top pool. six? What about top six? That's Doesn't what count. he'll be saying. <laughs> that is it for us today here at the Heroes Global Championship. Join us tomorrow for more amazing matches. Good night.